This Hall of Famer is the subject of our bonus biography round on Olympia Sports Challenge. This week, the California Angels, Nolan Ryan, Joe Rudy, and Frank Tanana accept the challenge of the 1948 World Champion Cleveland Indians, Bob Feller, Lou Boudreau, and Larry Doby. And now, let's meet the host of Sports Challenge, Dick Ember. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, and welcome fans from coast to coast and around the world to Sports Challenge. Now, we had a most exciting game last week, the California Angels in overtime. Got the mystery guest, Frank Tanana, with a lump in his throat after pressing the buzzer, guest Leo DeRocher. So you meet the challenge of uh, the team of yesteryear. More than 30 years ago, they cheered in Municipal Stadium, Cleveland, Ohio, Bob Feller, Lou Boudreaux, and Larry Doby as they won the pennant in 1948. And we'll begin our first category, Game Savers, and a catch by the incredible Willie Mays that was described as an optical illusion right after this sports challenge timeout. Here we go, the Angels against the Indians on Sports Challenge, your first category, men. Game Savers. It's the 1954 series, and say hey. Top of the eighth, Dick Wirtz, the hitter for the Indians, a 2-2 tie. Two on, Don Little, the left-hander for the Giants on the mound from the stretch. The swing and a deep drive to center field. Way, way out there. Willie Mays goes back and makes an incredible catch. Willie Mays, a 460-foot out, and the game remains tied. You were in the dugout uh, when you saw that one, Lou. Vic Worse's drive that went for a long out. When it left his bat, do you think Mays had any chance to catch it? Not at all. It was a fantastic catch, but a more of a fantastic throw back to the infield that held Larry Doby, who was on second. He had rounded third, ready to score, and he had to go all the way back to second. Nobody advanced on that fly ball. He was an incredible athlete, Willie Mays. It was no optical illusion. Now for 10 points or 20 points, your toss-up. Mays could do it all. Among his records, he was one of four, four National League right-handers to ever hit 50 or more home runs in a single season. Only one left-handed National Leaguer did it. Your 20-point toss-up, name the only National League left-handed hitter to hit 50 or more homers in a season. The only left, Nolan Ryan. Eddie Matthews. Eddie Matthews is a good guess, but not the correct answer. Interestingly, although he hit over 500, he didn't do it. So we can give a clue to the Cleveland Indians. He was known as the Big Cat, and he played for the Cardinals, the Giants, and the Yankees. Feller. Mize. Johnny Mize is correct for 20 points. Mize, the only one ever to do it. All right, the free throws go to the Cleveland Indians. Here's a game and a World Series saver from the 72 series. Game two. The A's lead Cincinnati, 2 0, bottom of the ninth, nobody out, as we join Kurt Gowdy. Tony Perez's leadoff single pumps life in the Cincinnati Hearts, with Dennis Menke coming up next. He tags that one. And Joe Rudy makes an unbelievable catch, and Perez has to hustle back to first. And now a second look at the catch that ranks among the most spectacular in World Series history. Rudy leaps and makes the grab backhanded while bracing himself against the wall. On the way down, his glove turns. You can see the ball showing through the back of the webbing. An absolutely fantastic play that they'll be talking about for years to come. I understand it was Christmas time before you got the green paint off your face. <laughs> Great to get to that wall. All right, the Indians, your free throw. Three years later, in 1975, the Reds were victimized again in the series, this time by the Red Sox. Joe Morgan hit what should have been a game-winning homer, but a Red Sox right fielder saved the game. For 10 points, Indians, who robbed Morgan in game six? You have five seconds. Dwight Evans. Dwight Evans is correct, says Larry Dolby. Dwight Evans of the Red Sox. 30 to nothing, second free throw belongs to Cleveland. We go to 1947, the World Series. Game six, Dodgers eight, Yankees five. Here's Red Barber's superb account of World Series history. Here ahead, eight to five. And the crowd well knows that one swing of this bat this fellow's capable of making it a brand new game again. Joe leans in. He has one for three today. Six hits so far in the series. Out to deep, round toward left, the infield overshifted. Here's the pitch. Swung on, belted. It's a long one, deep to north center, back for 
for Jean Pito. Back, 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 back. He makes a one-handed catch against the bullpen. Go to Maggio, robbed by Jean Frito's catch, of course, series history. It took the Yanks 30 years to get revenge against the Dodgers. It came in game four of the 77 series. The Dodgers trailed 3-2 when Ron Say was robbed by a Yankee left fielder who jumped above the fence to save the game for the New Yorkers. For 10 points, Cleveland, name that Yankee outfielder. Five seconds. Time is up, so we can double the point total. 20 points. It's worth to you, the Angels, if you can name that Yankee outfielder. Lou Pinella. Lou Pinella is correct, says Frank Tanana. <laughs> so the score after the first round. The Cleveland Indians, 30. The California Angels, 20. A new category, men, superstars. Secretariat has already won the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness. Now to the Belmont for the third jewel of racing's triple crown. Here's Chick Anderson. Secretariat was the ninth horse to win racing's Triple Crown. Prior to Secretariat in 73, no horse had won the Triple Crown honors for 25 years, not since 48. Your 20-point toss-up, who won the Triple Crown that year? Joe Rudy. Citation. Citation is correct. <laughs> Joe Rudy seems to be toughest on those old-time questions. <laughs> That's worth 20 points and the lead, 40 to 30. Citation rode by Eddie R. Carroll back in that year. All right, first free throw superstars. This superstar put the lid on one of baseball's most exciting pennant races. It's 1948. One game, winner-take-all playoff, American League pennant, 1948. Boston and the Indians. Danny Galehouse delivers Lou Boudreaux, swings and sends one deep to left field. It's in the screen, home run for Boudreaux. And the player skipper of the Indians gets his team on front, one nothing. Boston ties it 1-1 in the fourth inning. Ellis Kinder on the mound for Boston. Joe Gordon, singles, Boudreaux the pennant. And here comes Kenny Keltner. Kinder into the windup. Keltner swings and smashes one deep to left. Back, back, back. It's over the monster. Home run. A three-run blast by Kenny Keltner here in the fourth inning. The Indians lay four to one. And behind James Jordan's 20th win of the season, Cleveland goes to the World Series with an eight to three victory at Boston. And of course, the 48 Indians stayed in Boston and beat the Braves 4-2 for the series. Hall of Famer Lou Boudreau went 4-4 four for four in that game, and it reminds us of another Hall of Famer, Ted Williams, in the 46 All-Star game. The Thumper went 4-4, four for four, including a couple of home runs, and one of those against an Ethos pitch. They reported uh, that to be the first time ever that ball hit for a home run. For 10 points, Angels, who threw that Ethos, that blooper pitch that Williams hit out of the park in 46? I'm sure you all remember well. Five seconds. It's a wild guess. Rip Sewell, for some reason. I would... What is it? Sewell, Rip Sewell. I think that it's a wrong pronunciation, but -E it's the uh, right. S E W E L L. What? S E W E L L. We've got to give you that. Rip Sewell is correct. <laughs> Sewell. I'm sure Rip will be happy to know that. All right. The uh, free throw by the Angels gives them a 20 point lead. Second free throw. Here's a superstar. One of our panelists who made the history books, Nolan Ryan of the Angels, ninth inning drama of a no hitter against the Kansas City Royals. There's one out. Fastball gets him. We're down to the final out. Nolan Ryan, one out away from pitching the third no hit, no run game by a California Angel pitcher. Get to right field and deep. Very going back. He's got it. Nolan Ryan has a no hit, no run game, and they swarm the 26 year old Alvin, Texas native. Ryan has no hit the Kansas City Royals. The Angels win 3 nothing. And Ryan goes on to pitch three more. No hitters, the first man in American League history to throw four of them. The oldest man to pitch a no hitter was 41 year old Cy Young. The youngest did it for Oakland in 1970 at the age of 21. For 10 points, name him. Nolan? Uh, Catfish Hunter. That's incorrect. 
That's oh. incorrect. He did pitch a no-hitter, but he was not the youngest. So for 20 points, Cleveland, you can tie the game. Who was that youngest ever no-hit pitcher? Vita Blue. Vita Blue is correct. It's tied at 50-50. So that's it at the halfway mark in this one. The Angels and the Indians, dead even. 50 for the Californians and 50 for the Clevelanders. And we'll be back with our third category, unexpected moments and a historic play involving two of our Hall of Fame panelists. The first is Sports Challenge. Time. We'll return in a moment to Sports Challenge on Classic Sports Network. We now return to Sports Challenge on Classic Sports Network. Our current champion, the California Angels, have 50 at the halfway mark in the 1948 Cleveland Indians with 50 as well, a tie game. Before we go on, gentlemen, we've got two men who between them have seven no-hitters. Bob Feller of the Indians has three, Nolan Ryan with four. They both, in their era, that's right, I think they deserve that applause, probably were are not acknowledged as throwing the ball harder than anyone else in baseball. They both had that tremendous fastball, and yet neither is oversized, that large man. Bob, where did you credit your speed, the velocity of your pitches? Good Lord gave it to me. And milking cows every morning and night in the farm in Iowa didn't hurt. As Bob says, it's a God-gifted talent. And uh, I think that uh, it'd be hard to analyze why maybe Bob and I could throw harder than some other pitchers. It's, it's tough to say. All right, here we go. Category three, a tie game. New category is unexpected moments. We're going to go back to the 1948 World Series. 40,000 fans jamming Braves Field in Boston to see Bob Feller duel Johnny Say, and they've not been disappointed. No score in the eighth inning, and Bill Falcow, the catcher of the Braves, has just turned a leadoff walk. So Feller gets himself in a bit of trouble, walking that leadoff man, and Phil Macy comes in to run for Falcow. There's McCormick run up the first baseline, and Feller makes the play. The sacrifice is perfect. Macy goes into second base, and the hitter, Eddie Sankey, but he'll not get a chance to swing the bat. He has walked intentionally. That put runners at first and second, sets up the double play, and to the plate comes the outstanding hitting outfielder, Tommy Holmes of the Braves. Runners at second and first. Feller with Boudreaux. There goes Boudreaux. They're going to try to pick off Macy. Feller whirls and throws, and they've got him. No, no, Stewart calls him save. Oh, what a close play. The Braves are still alive. Feller at the belt. The pitch to Holmes. Holmes slashes one down the left field line. That's going to be in for a base hit. Mitchell up with the ball. Here comes the throw. Here comes Macy. He scores, and the Braves beat the Indians one to nothing. Feller denied a World Series victory, but the farm boy from Van Meter, Iowa, has a trip to Cooperstown. Bob Feller belongs in the Hall of Fame. Lou Boudreaux, you've had a lot of time to think about that. Was he out or was he safe? He was out. All right, let's go on. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the question. The toss-up. Both sides ready. Hall of Famer Bobby Feller won 20 games at the tender age of 21. Only three other pitchers ever won 20 or more games that early at 21. Chrissy Mathewson was one. Ralph Branca was one. And a Boston Red Sox pitcher in 1917 did it. Your 20-point toss-up, name that 1917 left-handed pitcher, Joe Rudy. Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth is correct. <laughs> We're going to examine Rudy's locker when he gets back with the Angel Ball Club to see where he hides that formula to keep him from looking gray. Babe Ruth, what an amazing athlete he must have been. He won over 20 ball games at the age of 21 and then went on to be one of the great hitters of all time. All right, you've won. They toss up. Here are your free throws, Angels. The 53 championship game, Lions and the Cleveland Browns. Cleveland's ahead, 16 to 10, only two minutes remaining. Along. Bobby Lane has driven the Lions to win late in the ball game. They trail by six, but Lane has taken the Lions from deep in their own territory to the Cleveland 38 yard line. The pitch is to Bob Smith. He is hit at the 33. Fumbles one down. Laterals to Walker. Walker gets out of bounds at the 25 yard line, but hold up the ball was dead at the 33. Lane sets his line. Only seconds remaining in the game. It's a bomb to Jim Doran. Touchdown! And the Lions are the champions of pro football. And ironically, Jim Dorn is only in the game because Leon Hart was injured and caught that pass that uh, went on to win the championship for the Lions. Ten points for the California Angels with a correct answer. Bobby Lane, an All-American at Texas, was drafted by the Bears in 1948. That gave the Bears three All-American quarterbacks, all of whom, interestingly, had a name that began with L. One was Luckman, one was Lane. For ten points, named the ex-Notre Dame star who was the third quarterback who began with a letter, name began with a letter L. Five seconds, quiet please. 
Time is up, so we can double the point total. If the Indians can come up with the answer, they tie the game. 20 points to you. Who was the third L? Luckman, Lane, and a, another quarterback. Lou Jack. Lou Jack is correct. Johnny Lou Jack of Notre Dame. So it's tied again at 70. The free throw belongs to the Angels to break the tie. It's the 41 series. Dodgers trail the Yanks two games to one. Hugh Casey pitching for Brooklyn, two outs, ninth inning, one strike away from a 4-3 to three win, which would even up the fall classic. Ebbets filled in Brooklyn, and the Dodgers are about to pull even in this 41 World Series. They lead the Yankees 4-3 to three in the ninth inning, and Hugh Casey's done a great job. Two strikes on Henry. He swings and misses strike three. The game should be over, but the ball gets away. Mickey Owen back to the backstop, and Henry to save it first base. And uh-oh, here comes Joe DiMaggio. The Yankees down by only one. DiMaggio swings, base hits left field. Keller swings, long drive, right field. It's back, back to Steve Walker. Washington bounce high off the wall. Here comes Henry to tie it. Sad moment for Owen at the time, but history often repeats itself, Angels. In the 73 series, Game 3, A's 2, Mets 2, the 11th inning, the New York catcher let the third strike get away, allowing Campanaris to score the winning run. Ten points. Who was that receiver? Jerry Grody. Jerry Grody is correct for ten points. They broke in the tie. So after three rounds, it's the Angels 80 and the Cleveland Indians 70. Good close game. And here we go, men. Our fourth category, the classics. One famous film click, clip, one question worth 30 big points. The last game of the 61 season, Roger Maris attempting to break Babe Ruth's record. Here's Joe Rizzuto. first homer. All right, 30 points at stake, men. What active player, that's a good piece of sports trivia, what active player was in uniform that historic day and also in uniform when Henry Aaron hit his 715th home run? Joe Rudy. Al Downing. Al Downing is correct with the Yankees when Maris hit his 61st and of course he threw the ball let Henry Aaron hit for number 715. So after four rounds, the score, the Angels 110 and the Cleveland Indians 70. And in a moment, our bonus biography round. We'll see who wins this game. Sports Challenge returns after this timeout. Time now for the bonus biography round. It's worth 60 points. The Indians trail the Angels 110 to 70. So both teams very much alive. Ready, gentlemen? Good luck to both sides. Here are your clues. This Hall of Famer went from the plains of Texas to the winds of Chicago. He was then passed to the New York Bulldogs and the Lions' den. In 52 and 53, he led the Detroit Lions down the lane to two NFL championships. As a quarterback, his fiery temperament helped his favorite receiver, Lou Boudreau. Bobby Lane. That's right, our mystery guest is the great quarterback, Bobby Lane. The Indians get the mystery guest, but let's check the score. The final score, the Angels beat the Indians 110-107. And here he is, the former all-time great with the Lions, Bobby Lane. How you doing, Bob? Right. You remember one pass most of all, one play most of all, one player most of all? Oh, I think the championship game in 53 when we had uh, just a few seconds and we hit Jim Dorn for that touchdown, I think that was the most thrilling. And, of course, um, you were in the same backfield with a guy you played. Didn't you play high school ball with Doak Walker? Right. He was one of the greatest players that I ever played with. All right, fi final question. All the time you played, who hit you hardest of all? You remember one? Gino Marchetti. He played with the Baltimore Colts. He was the toughest defensive man I played against. And he didn't say, I'm sorry, when he finished with you. Oh, yeah. He, felt, he said he was sorry, but he still hit me. <laughs> Bobby Lane, our mystery guest. They want to meet you over there, Bobby. Fine. We'll talk to our stars, recap the scores right after this sports challenge timeout. 
Well, the Cleveland Indians guess our mystery guest, Bobby Lane, but they missed by just three seconds the winner of Sports Challenge, the California Angels, 110 to 107. Stay fans, be with us next week. The Angels, who won two in a row, will accept the challenge. Well, we're going to go to the round ballers, the Boston Celtic Hall of Famers, Bob Cousy, Red Auerbach, and Bill Sharman. For Olympia Sports Challenge, this is Dick Enberg.